We'll get started in a couple of minutes with the South Atlantic Board. We're just waiting for one of our speakers to get back from lunch. Okay, can we take our seats so we can get started with the South Atlantic Board? Russ is giving me the high five, so it's time to get started. My name is Pat Gear, and I'm the chairman of the South Atlantic Board Committee. Uh, first item, I'm going to switch things around a little bit on the agenda. I want to approve the minutes from the August meeting. Any changes? Any modifications? Hearing none, I'll consider them approved. Uh, we have a couple of changes to the agenda. There have been a few versions of it floating around, so I want to make sure we have things right. We're not going to discuss the 2014 FMP review and state compliance reports for spot, spot sea trout, and Spanish mackerel just for time constraints. And we're going to add a brief discussion on the end for about Spanish mackerel and changes uh, related to Amendment 20B from the National Marine Fishery Service and how, how this may impact us at all. Kirby will do that. Um, so those are the changes to the agenda. Do I see any other comments, any, any additions to the agenda that are, aren't listed or mentioned already? I will consider that approved. Is there anybody from the general public who'd like to make a statement? I don't have anything from anybody. Seeing none, that is, we'll move on. All right, the next, uh, the, the major, uh, topic for this meeting is to discuss the Black Drum uh, Benchmark Stock Assessment, and we're going to start off with Jeff Kipp, and then uh, Dr. Cynthia Jones from Old Dominion will give the peer review from that, and uh, probably wait for Kirby to run up here. Did I forget anything? I, th I thought I did that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, let's move on to um, Jeff, and we'll start talking about the stock assessment. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To outline my presentation, uh, I'm going to start by going over the data that went into the assessment. Uh, then I'll move on to the methods that were used in the assessment, um, go over the reference points in the stock status, and I'll wrap up with uh, research recommendations. Uh, this figure shows the coastwide harvest, uh, and as you can see, the um, harvest has been primarily from recreational fisheries. Um, but going to the commercial landings data, uh, the data was uh, obtained from uh, archived U.S. Fish and Commission reports from 1887 to 1944, uh, the National Marines Fisheries Service from 1945 to 1949, uh, and was pulled from the ACC SP data warehouse from 1950 to 2012. Uh, the commercial landings by state, uh, historically, uh, most of the black drum have been landed in Virginia and Florida, um, but following some uh, regulations implemented in Florida in the 1980s and the Gilbet gillnet ban in the 1990s, uh, most black drum are, have been, recently been landed in uh, Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, the commercial landing size data, there is some size data available from Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, and the Southeast Fisheries Science Center trip interview program. Um, but of note, only the North Carolina DMF sampling program uh, has averaged more than 65 length samples a year, overall gears and month. Um, so there is limited length data available from the commercial fisheries. Uh, but the available data, length data, does indicate that primarily harvest of immature fish in the South Atlantic and primarily mature fish in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, this table shows the coast-wide age samples from all the data sources that we have uh, with length bins going down the table and year from 1985 to 2012 going across the table. Um, highlighted in red are uh, year and size bin combinations where there were less than five age samples. Uh, highlighted in yellow are where there were five to nine age samples. And highlighted in green are where there were more than nine samples. Um, so as you can see, there's been uh, limited age sampling, especially for the larger, older fish. Um, but there has been some increased sampling in, in the uh, mo most recent years. Um, some caveats, biases, and uh, uncertainty to point out for the commercial landings. Uh, the historical landings, especially from those old U.S. Fish and Commission reports, are, are highly uncertain. Uh, the NIMS landings that precede required trip ticket pr programs are likely underreported. Uh, there's limited gear information in early years. 
uh, no reliable commercial discard data. And there are some issues with species identification and reporting. Um, for example, fish landed as drum and not identified to species level were not included in the landings data. Uh, and also one other note in Florida, um, some black drum are possibly landed as miscellaneous or industrial fish and those landings also were not included. Uh, these, this is the uh, harvest estimates from the MRFs and the MRIP. Uh, on the top figure are the harvest estimates in pounds, and on the bottom figure are harvests uh, in numbers. And you can see in the 2000s there has been a noticeable increase in harvest. And these are the uh, proportional standard errors, uh, which provide a measure of precision for the harvest estimates from the MRFs and MRIP. Uh, PSEs greater than 50 indicate a very imprecise estimate. Uh, and on this uh, table, you've got uh, your years going down the table and states uh, from the southernmost Florida uh, up to the northernmost uh, New Jersey uh, going across the table. And you can see that uh, precision generally decreases as you move up the coast. Uh, and in the last column is the coastwide PSEs for the coastwide harvest estimates. Uh, which all are generally uh, better than the uh, state and year levels. These are the recreational harvest estimates by state. Uh, and you can see that Florida has been a primary contributor to, to recreational harvest uh, over most of the years. Um, but of note, in, in recent years, uh, there has been increased harvest in mid-Atlantic states, uh, notably New Jersey. And this is just another look uh, broken down by region. Again, as I noticed in, uh, noted in the commercial landings uh, data and also we'll go over in the recreational data, um, most of the data indicates that there is a, a pretty uh, uh, clear break in the size structure of fish that are, are harvested and landed uh, in the mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic. Um, but historically, most of the, the recreational harvest has been in the South Atlantic, uh, but again, a, a recent increase in the mid-Atlantic states. This is the length data available from the MRSA and NRIP. Uh, on the top panel are the states in the South Atlantic, and on the lower panel are the states in the uh, Mid-Atlantic. And you've got years from 1981 to 2012 going down each uh, panel, and each wave estimate going across each panel from wave one to wave six. Uh, and uh, cells that are highlighted in gray, there was no harvest estimate for that uh, wave and year combination. Uh, cells highlighted in red, there was less than 10 sample, length samples collected. Uh, and cells highlighted in green, there was uh, at least 10 length samples collected. And as you can see in, in Florida and North Carolina, notably uh, in more recent years, there's been decent coverage based on these metrics. Uh, but the length sampling uh, is sparse and very limited in uh, the mid-Atlantic states especially. There are some supplemental recreational sampling programs uh, from Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Um, none, none of these sampling programs averaged more than 73 length samples uh, a year over all, all waves and modes in the recreational fisheries. Um, so again, the, the length sampling data is, is very limited. Um, but the uh, available length data does indicate uh, the same type of harvest with primarily uh, harvest of immature fish in the South Atlantic and uh, mature fish in the mid-Atlantic. And these are the uh, MRFs and MRIP recreational release estimates uh, and numbers from 1981 to 2012 with a generally increasing trend over the time series. Um, so some of the assessment methods we considered uh, required a complete catch history. Uh, and we only have MRFs and MRIP uh, recreational estimates back to 1981. Uh, so we used uh, some Fish and Wildlife Service license, fishing license data and also the, the mean um, CPUE from the MRFs data from 1981 to 1985 to estimate recreational uh, harvest and releases um, back to 1950. Uh, and when we didn't have that fi uh, Fish and Wildlife Service fishing license data, we used uh, uh, extrapolated harvest back on uh, exponential regression and assume, assume negligible releases back to 1900 which is the date we're using for the beginning of the fishery. So these are the final recreational harvest estimates from 1900 to 2012. 
and these are the final recreational releases estimates uh, from 1950 to 2012. Uh, again, we assume negligible releases prior to 1950. Uh, and on the top figure are the total releases in pounds, and on the bottom figure are uh, assumed dead releases uh, based on an 8% mortality rate. Uh, and that mortality rate is from the red drum stock assessment uh, due to the similarities in, in uh, life histories and fisheries. Um, there are no uh, discard mortality rate studies uh, for black drum. Some biases and caveats for the MRFs and MRIP data. Uh, MRFs and MRIP note that pulse fisheries have less precise estimates, which is fishery could be considered a, a pulse fishery, especially in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, state programs have recorded harvest in strata where MRFs and MRIP have estimated no harvest. Uh, and there have been some reports of um, somewhat significant night fisheries uh, in certain states. Um, the TC and SAS, uh, stock assessment subcommittee were con uh, concerned with this. Um, however, the, the phone survey should, uh, for, and the MRFs and MRFs should capture effort data. Uh, and as long as catch rates between night and day are similar, this wouldn't be uh, a major issue. But if there are some differences uh, in catch rates between night and day, um, that could lead to some biases in the estimates. Um, there was minimal data and some recent uh, nighttime biological sam or sampling, um, but the results were inconclusive with that data. For fishery independent data sources, we evaluated uh, 28 fishery independent data sources. Uh, few regularly encountered black drum, especially adults. Uh, and most data sets were excluded for developing indices of abundance. Uh, because of low number of positive observations. Uh, only eight data sources were used uh, for tracking abundance. Uh, and all data sets with biological data were used for life history analyses. Um, so for indices of abundance, we use a decision tree to standardize indices. None of these surveys were designed to target black drum, so there are likely uh, variables that are leading to changes in catchability over time. Uh, so we try and standard standardize those, those changes in catchability uh, and pull out the true index of abundance. Uh, there was one fishery-dependent data source uh, from the MERS and MRIP access point angler intercept data. Uh, and altogether, we had five indices tracking young of year abundance, um, three from the Delaware Bay, uh, one from Maryland Coastal Bays, and uh, one from Georgia. We had uh, five indices tracking uh, primarily immature fish, uh, less than 600 millimeters in total length, uh, one from North Carolina, one from South Carolina, and then uh, three from the Florida SANE survey, three ind individual indices. And then one index tracking what we assume was an entire exploitable stock, and that's the MERS and MRIP index. Uh, so this figure shows the young of year indices. Uh, again, there were three from the Delaware Bay, a Delaware 30 foot and 16 foot trawl surveys, and the PSEG SANE survey, uh, and one from the Maryland Coastal Bays, and one from uh, Georgia. And this figure shows the, image, the indices tracking immature black drum uh, with one from South Carolina, one from North Carolina, and three indices from Florida. And this is the MRSA and MREP index. Uh, and you can see a generally increasing trend over the time series from 1982 to 2012. Uh, we did some life history analysis to develop life history parameters for uh, assessment methods used. Uh, and this is just a table of the data sources that were used to develop those life history parameters. Um, data from Delaware, uh, the NEMAP and chest map surveys, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And so some of the assessment methods uh, that were, were used in the assessment, uh, we did some trend analysis, uh, per accrued analysis, uh, and also looked at some catch-based uh, methods, including the depletion corrected average catch, uh, what we call the catch MSY method, and depletion-based stock reduction analysis. Uh, with the trend analysis, we looked at associations between indices, uh, and we also uh, used a Mankindle analysis to test for either increasing or de decreasing trends in the indices. Uh, and the results of those analysis suggested uh, significant positive associations uh, between indices from different surveys, 
Uh, most notably, the young of your indices in the mid-Atlantic. So that suggested that these, these uh, surveys are tracking abundance uh, reliably. Uh, the only trend detected in any of the indices was in the MRFs and MRIP index, and that was an increasing trend. Um, and of note, this contradicted other indices uh, that were available, and it also contradicted the general understanding of the fishery, of a, a somewhat developing fishery over the time period of that MRFs and MRIP index. For a per recruit analysis, it's a per, per capita age structured model that uses uh, survivorship along with age schedules of size, weight, mortality, fecundity, maturity, and harvest vulnerability. Uh, estimates uh, equal of yield per recruit and spawning potential ratios uh, over a range of exploitation rates and minimum size limits. Um, but this was not endorsed by the Stock Assessment Subcommittee due to lack of information on selectivity in the fisheries and fishery, fishing mortality. Um, so our primary methods we looked at in the assessment were catch-based methods. Uh, these require a removal history, which we had av available. Uh, they do not require an index of abundance. Um, and there are some meta-analyses and data available to inform uh, the required input parameters for these methods. Uh, it is good practice to compare several of these methods. They are, are somewhat similar. Uh, so we evaluated three methods. Um, as I mentioned, depletion corrected average catch, or DCAC, uh, catch MSY, and depletion based stock reduction analysis, or DBSRA. Um, some advantages of these catch based methods uh, performance of the methods uh, relative to data rich methods has been evaluated. Uh, and found fairly robust, given assumptions are correct. Uh, these methods provide a good alternative to estimate reference points for data poor stocks that lack information on size composition and abundance, uh, but do have information on life history and removals. Some limitations. Uh, these methods were developed to estimate catch reference points, uh, not necessarily to make stock status determination. Uh, they are conditional on subjective depletion assumptions, and they do not fit estimates to any abundance data. And uncertainty can be uh, incorporated with these methods uh, by specifying distributions for input parameters and data, uh, running a number of model iterations with parameters drawn from those distributions, uh, and then calculating reference points from accepted iterations to develop probability, probability distributions. Uh, uncertainty can also be explored with sensitivity analyses. Uh, so of the three catch-based methods, um, the Stock Assessment Subcommittee and Technical Committee chose DBSRA as the preferred method. Uh, and this was based on several reasons. Uh, the DCAC does not incorporate a population dynamics model. Uh, it's just a, a slightly modified average catch. Um, so these are, uh, DBSRA is slightly more complex than that uh, DCAC method. Uh, catch MSY is not robust for lightly exploited stocks. Uh, the life history and productivity parameters required for DBSR DBSRA are better defined in meta-analyses that were available. And DBSRA uh, is more robust, was more robust in sensitivity analysis and projections. Um, so some background on the DBSRA method. Uh, the method essentially estimates what carrying capacity must be if a stock is at a recent biomass level given a time series of removals. Uh, the observed time series of removal, removals is assumed to start uh, at unfished stock conditions. Um, so the biomass in that first year, which I mentioned was 1900, is assumed uh, equal to your carrying capacity. I uh, select life history uh, and stock condition parameters from distributions and project biomass forward with a production model and the removal history. Uh, and then you iteratively solve for the carrying capacity based on that assumed uh, depletion in a, a current year. Uh, these were the results of the DBSRA base run. Uh, the overfishing limit, or OFL, the median estimate in, uh, was 4.12 million pounds. And for the maximum sustainable yield, the median estimate was 2.12 million pounds. Uh, and you can see the distribution of those uh, estimates in the, the figure below. Uh, these are the biomass estimates tr um, projected with the production model. The biomass estimates are the black lines. 
and uh, the BMSY reference point are the red lines uh, with the solid lines being the median and the dashed lines being the interquartile range around the median estimate. Um, so you can see here biomass uh, has been estimated to decline slightly and stead steadily um, but never falls below that BMSY level. And this is the exploitation estimated with DBSRA. Uh, the exploitation is the, are the black lines and the exploitation at maximum sustainable yield are the red lines. Uh, again, with the solid lines being the median estimate and the dashed lines being the interquartile range around those median estimates. And you can see the only year that exploitation exceeded uh, the exploitation at maximum sustainable yield was in 2008 when there was a big uh, peak in harvest and recreational harvest. Um, so at the recommendation of the peer review, we did some projections with this method. Uh, and for this projection here, we used the removals equal to the average removals from 2010 to 2012, which was 1.56 million pounds, and projected that catch forward as a catch for the next 20 years. And you can see that uh, biomass remains steady uh, uh, over those two years in this projection. And another projection, uh, was setting the removals projected forward equal to the DBSRA median MSY estimate of 2.12 million pounds, uh, which shows uh, a slight uh, decrease in biomass over the time series of the projection. Uh, we did some sensitivity analysis looking at changes to the depletion uh, parameters, input parameters, and removals time series. Uh, we found that depletion, uh, it is sensitive to depletion assumptions um, and based on the recommendation of the peer review panel uh, for that depletion parameter that we use in this method, uh, we assumed a broad uniform distribution to uh, capture some of that uncertainty. And this is a comparison of the sustainable yield estimates from uh, each of the three catch base methods with the DCAC median uh, sustainable yield being the green line uh, that is the lowest, the DBSRA median MSY being the orange line, and the catch MSY median MSY is the blue line, and uh, the removals history is the black dotted line. Uh, and of note, the sustainable yield estimated of the DCAC is not uh, equivalent to MSY. It's a, a slightly more precautionary yield estimate that's not likely to exceed MSY. So as expected, it is lower than the other methods. Um, so the reference points from the DBSRA, uh, for a, a catch target, the median DB, DBSRA MSY estimate is recommended of 2.12 million pounds. And for a, a catch threshold, uh, the median DBSRA OFL estimate um, of 4.12 million pounds is recommended. And uh, the OFL is a product of current biomass and maximum sustainable exploitation, uh, and it indicates uh, a threshold for overfishing. Um, for stock status, uh, the black drum stock is, is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. And this is based on the results of the catch base methods, uh, the life history of the, the species, and uh, indices of abundance that were available. And these are the uh, research recommendations that the Technical Committee and Stock Assessment Subcommittee came up with. The high priority research recommendations uh, are to age odalis that have been collected and archived, uh, collect information to characterize the size composition of fish discarded in recreational fisheries, collect information on the magnitude and sizes of commercial discards, um, increase biological sampling in commercial fisheries to better characterize the size and age composition of commercial fisheries by state and gear, increase biological sampling in recreational fisheries to better characterize the size and age composition by state and wave, obtain estimates of selectivity at age for commercial fisheries by gear, recreational harvests, and recreational discards, Continue all current fishery independent surveys and collect biological samples uh, for black drum on all surveys. Uh, and develop a fishery independent adult survey. Um, consider long line and purse stain surveys. Collect age samples, especially in states where maximum size regula regulations preclude the collection of adequate adult ages. 
and four, uh, moderate uh, research recommendations, uh, conduct reproductive studies, including age and size specific fecundity, spawning uh, frequency, spawning behaviors by region, and movement and site fidelity of spawning adults. Conduct a high reward tagging program to obtain return, uh, improved return rate estimates. Uh, continue to expand current tagging programs to obtain mortality and growth information and movement at, uh, uh, at size data. Improve sampling of nighttime fisheries. Conduct studies to estimate catch and release mortality uh, in recreational fisheries. Uh, collect genetic material over a long time span to obtain information on movement and population structure and potentially estimate population size and obtain better estimates of harvest from the black drum recreational fishery uh, especially in states with short seasons. Um, so that concludes my presentation. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Are there any specific questions for Jeff at this time? Okay, don't all jump up at once. All right, well, hearing none, um, I guess we'll move on to the peer review report. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Cynthia Jones from Old Dominion University and she'll give us the peer review. Good afternoon. Jeff covered a, a great deal and so I can be uh, brief. Um, the information in the peer review, external peer review, is uh, available. Yeah, I don't, this is the wrong, okay, never mind. Uh, the peer review panel was held from November 11th through the 14th. Um, can I take a minute because I need to double check this does not look like the right presentation that I have here? And so it would take a minute for me to reload. Is that possible? Okay. I don't know how that happened. Pieces. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, the committee consisted of uh, me as chair, uh, Gary Nielsen, um, Dr. Nielsen, Dr. Yao, and Dr. Cope. All of those people have expertise in uh, data poor methods. The stock assessment uh, was accepted. Uh, the stock is not overfished, and overfishing was not occurring in 2015. The panel found that the stock assessment was acceptable for management use. We also commended the stock assessment uh, team on the uh, true high quality of work that they did. Our first term of reference was to evaluate the thoroughness of data collection and the presentation and treatment of fishery dependent and fishery independent data in the assessment. Our finding was that age could be adequately read from otolith annuli and that the size at age is reliable. However, the recreational catch data were obtained from Murphys MRIP. Uh, the CPU estimates were not consistent over time, and that is because of the infrequency of intercepts. Uh, this tends to be a seasonal fishery, a pulse fishery, and uh, in specific locations. And because of that, um, Murphys uh, selects the most commonly used sites, and so some of the black drum sites 
are included infrequently or with low probability. <clears throat> uh, this is exacerbated by short season fishery and sporadic availability of intercepts due to the migratory behavior, especially in the northern part of the range. And you saw that in Jeff's presentation of the imprecision and the lack of data accumulation for this stock. Coverage of the commercial fisheries landings came from disparate sources um, over the catch history with inconsistencies in coverage and gears. Uh, there is no fishery independent surveys to monitor black drum. Uh, eight indices in total were used in the assessment and standardized either with the delta method in combination with a log normal distribution or with a binomial uh, GLM. The panel considered that a credible analysis of the available data. The second term of reference is that the methods and models used to estimate the population parameters uh, and biological reference points included were, in, but not limited to, evaluation of the choice and justification of the preferred model. Um, if multiple models were considered, evaluate the analyst's explanation for any difference in the results and evaluate model parameterization and specification. The panel looked at the four models that were presented to us for candidate stock assessment. They rely only on catch and life history information and those, as Jeff said, were the trend and peer, uh, uh, per recruit analysis, catch MSY, uh, DCAC, and DBSRA. For the per recruitment analysis, it's an equilibrium approach and the drawback to it was the lack of knowledge of selectivity, as Jeff has already said. The reference points were, in 90 for, were within the 95% credibility indices of the DBSRA. The catch MSY model used a Pella Tomlinson surplus production model, but when we asked the a team to do further projections, it showed that that model, in fact, was unstable in projecting forward. The depletion corrected average catch. It does not use a model of population dynamics, which is preferred. Uh, it adjusts the average catch based on assumptions about depletions and is sensitive to that, and it only gives a static yield calculation, which again is not preferable. The um, DBSRA um, used a flexible production model with a Monte Carlo resampling of inputs. It included uncertainty in the catch history, which is advisable. It was the most parent, transparent of the models that were presented to the panel. It also used the full time series of catches. However, it did have a high sensitive to, uh, to the <clears throat> biomass assumptions. The panel felt this was the preferred model to use for the stock assessment. We were asked to evaluate uh, the diagnostics performed uh, for yield per recruit and SPR, there is no sensitivity uh, diagnostic. For the catch MSY, um, it was robust across a wide range of R and K values, but it was relatively sensitive to the depletion in the terminal year. The sample retention for this method was also very low. Out of 10,000 sample inputs, only 5% were, were kept. And that tends to be a problem with the CATCH MSY model. The DCAC and DBSRA included additional assumptions on K, on the ratio between biomass in the terminal year and K and M. The DBSRA had a sample retention of 90% in comparison to the CATCH MSY. Term of reference four was to evaluate the methods used to characterize uncertainty in the estimated parameters, ensure that the implications of uncertainty in the technical conclusions were clearly stated. 
Again, no estimates for uncertainty were done for the yield per recruit or SPR, spawning potential ratio. The catch MSY uncertainty for MSY and management quantities was done from Monte Carlo sampling of the prior distributions. And that was chosen as a uniform prior. The DBSRA used uh, Monte Carlo in the input parameters and that uncertainty was uh, able to be perpetuated into the model de derived estimates. Term of reference five. Um, the panel was asked to recommend the best estimates of stock biomass abundance and exploitation from the assessment for use in management and if possible to specify alternative methods and measures. The panel concurred that the best model was the DBSRA with using the least informative priors. The population biomass was shown to be declining slowly with a steady increase in harvest and the population was not experiencing overfishing. We were asked in term of reference six to evaluate the choice of reference points and the methods used to estimate them uh, and to recommend stock status determination from the assessment if appropriate and if appropriate specify alternative methods and measures. The panel found and, and was unanimous in all our findings that the reference point determined by yield per recruit, DCAC, DBSAR, DBSRA, and the catch MSY. Uh, the DBSRA reference points, uh, reference point was the MSY of 211 million pounds. Term of reference seven was review the research data collection assessment methodology recommendations provided by the technical committee and make additional recommendations as warranted. Clearly prioritize the activities needed to inform and maintain the current assessment and provide recommendations to improve the reliability of future assessments. The panel recommendations were specifically to develop a protocol to alert the uh, stock assessment subcommittee to any major changes in harvest and F that could trigger a reassessment of the reference point similar to rumble strips approach developed by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council for data poor stocks. With any of these data poor stocks, um, you're using methods that are not quite as sensitive as a full age structured stock assessment. And so there's a real value in looking at each year's update and seeing whether there's any change that would tend to uh, worry you, in which case it might be a, a value to trigger that as a rumble strip so that you go back and look at the assessment in more detail. We felt it was important to increase the age sampling along the coast. The reason is that black drum is a very long-lived, highly productive fish in the sense that it reproduces, it grows fast, it reproduces early, and it has an enormous reproductive capacity. That is good because when you deplete the stock it means it can come back but it also is telling you that this fish lives in a very uncertain world and needs full age structure in order to be able to maintain itself at sustainable levels. The best way to determine whether it has full age structure is to have sufficient aging data that you can see any juvenescence that would occur in the stock. And so that's what we're asking for here. Increase age sampling along the coast, the juvenescence of the population is a good indicator of overfishing in this fishery and the availability of age data is crucial to being alerted to such changes in age structure. Indices such as the South Carolina Trammel Net Survey could be used directly in an extended version of DBSRA. The implementation of XDBSRA uh, which is another method, uh, could instead specify stock status at an earlier time period and therefore allow the most recent catches to inform population dynamics and thus stock status. Term of reference eight was to recommend the timing of the next benchmark assessment and updates. Um, if necessary, relative to the life history and current management of the species. 
again, because the panel felt that because of the black drum is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring, that it recommends that the next benchmark assessment take place in five years unless there is any indication with a rumble strip methodology that you've begun juvenessing the population and it starts to be in trouble. Overall, the review panel uh, found that the black, black drum, not drum, drum, I've worked with this species for years and I've never done a black drum. Black drum are in infrequent catch in the recreational and commercial fisheries. Their rarity and migration history leads to variable catch history. And again, in any of these data poor methods, the driver of the value of the method is that you have a really solid catch history and that the catch is a, a, a major portion of the abundance of the stock. Of the four data poor models used, the DBSRA proved to be the most reliable and provided stable estimates of biomass and MSY. Black drum is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. The median MSY was 2.11 million pounds with a median overfishing limit of 4.13 million pounds. Nevertheless, because of the life history characteristics in managing this stock, precaution should be used. Any questions? I guess the other thing I'd like to say is I really do want to commend the stock assessment scientist because they, I've been at a lot of CIE reviews and this was just a wonderful set of presentations they made to us and showed uh, enormously uh, dedicated uh, um, work on it and really high quality work. Are there any questions for Dr. Jones? John? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the great presentations. I was just curious, uh, the last point, one of the last points you brought up, Dr. Jones, about the looking at the change in the age structure as a warning. Is the data sensitive enough that we, how, how, how much of a change would we have to see before we'd uh, be thinking that there was a problem with the stock? Well, one of the reasons that uh, the data, one of the data recommendations from the panel was that more age data be taken, particularly for those older, larger fish, was to establish a better basis for which to make, to understand whether juvenescence was occurring. I know in the state of Virginia, we routinely, even with small sample size, we are routinely seeing 60-year-olds in the catches. Um, it would be nicer if we had uh, more data coastwide so that that could be assessed more readily. And so I would be able to then say to you, well, if I saw a truncation of 10% of the age distribution, I'd begin to be concerned. Um, and I don't think we can say that right now. Certainly I would be concerned if I didn't see 50-year-olds. And those fish will go fast. The older ages will go quickly if you're harvesting too heavily. Any other questions? Lewis? Just a, just a comment, just to follow up on, on uh, what Dr. Jones said as well as, as, well as Jeff. Um, I know the efforts that went into this assessment and you know I, this was something that I really pushed for. And I couldn't have asked for a better result in terms of the quality of the work that was done. So to Jeff, to, the, to the, everyone that was participated in this and the peer review panel, um, I really I feel good about this. I, I, I concur with with everything from the review panel, and and think we've probably done what we need to do in order to maintain this and keep an eye on the age structure. It's going to be hard to do, and it's going to take a commitment um, from some of the states that actually see those larger older fish, um, but take them in a fishery dependent sample so we don't go out and kill a bunch of 50, 60 year old fish just to get their otoliths. But I think that that is a that would be a useful exercise if we can get some of the northern states interested and involved. I know the southern states are going to be collecting some of the otoliths from the smaller fish, which is what we generally see. Um, and hopefully be ready for a benchmark in five years. But again, thank you very much, both Jeff and Dr. Jones. Just a comment on aging this fish. If you can't age this fish, you should be fired. 
um, it comes with numbers on its annual eye. But you do have to count to 50. Good point. Any other questions? Um, you know, it, Lewis? Um, without seeing the questions, I would make a motion that we uh, accept the benchmark stock assessment and peer review report for management use. Is that what you were looking for, Mr. Chairman? I, I believe it was in the hopper, yes. And I guess we have to get it up there. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and second it while we're waiting. Okay, we have a motion and a second by Joe Grist. And we're just going to get it up there. And the motion is moved to approve the Black Drum Stock Assessment and Peer Review Report for Management Use. Motion by Dr. Daniel and seconded by Mr. Grist. Um, Hearing no opposition to that and seeing a lot of hands going up for the second, uh, we'll consider that motion carried. And uh, I, pre and I want to say again, I appreciate the expertise and the thoroughness of Dr. Jones and her peer review and all the stock assessment biologists and, and technical um, committee members that worked on this because one of my staff worked pretty hard on this and he was in my office on a regular basis asking me questions about it and it was a very thorough job and you know it, that, w that went very smoothly and I think we all greatly appreciate your expertise and your thoroughness on this. All right. This is going to mark me as a nerd <laughs> but we had so much fun doing this stock assessment review. That's scary. <laughs> Um, moving on, now we have to decide how, uh, have a brief discussion on how we may use this information. And um, we went through this a little bit with Menhaden, but I think Menhaden is a much different beast than Black Drum. So um, I want to open the floor and, and, and get suggestions and ideas on how, how we want to move forward with this. So I see Lewis's hand up. I waited for another hand to go up, Mr. Chairman, before I suck it up again. Um, I agree with the peer review panel's advice to, to monitor the age structure. I think we, we took some good proactive measures early on to make sure that we had some, had some measures in place to try to protect those older fish, to try to limit the harvest, and to try to at least get some of our yield per recruit up in terms of harvesting so many juvenile fish at such small sizes. And I think we've been successful in that. Um, I would suggest that we continue monitoring the population, prepare for a five-year update, um, and take no further action at this time. Any other comments or suggestions? I don't, I don't think we need a motion on that, but just keep doing our jobs and doing it well. Everybody's in agreement with that? I see a lot of head nodding. Boy, you guys are making my life easy up here. I like this. Okay, um, the next, we'll consider that. Um, done with that, and thank you very much for the presentations. Um, Dr. Daniel is going to come up here now, and he's going to speak to us about um, southern flounder management in, um, in the southern states. Cool. Okay. Man, the last time I did this, I was on the technical committee. Is it up there? All right, the intent of this is really not to solicit any um, action. Um, what I wanted to do, and just to give you a brief history, is it was several years ago, four or five years ago, North Carolina does fishery management plans for various species, and we, we attempted a um, 
uh, a stock assessment on kingfishes. And I believe we used northern kingfish as our indicator species of the complex. And we did a stock assessment on that species, sent it out for peer review, and the peer review came back not usable for management purposes because these fish move, migrate into other jurisdictions. That, and we had modeled it as a closed population when indeed it was an open population. The way we have managed southern flounder in North Carolina um, ever since the original fishery management plan in 2005 was as a closed population. We did a North Carolina centric assessment and generated biological reference points and had reductions in harvest needed, et cetera. Um, and we had actually had an update during the, during the time series of the assessment. We just recently did an update on our southern flounder assessment and what we found was we looked at looking at some of the new information um, that's recently come out in Fishery Bulletin. It's suggesting that, um, I think it's a paper by uh, Midway, Cadron, and Scharf looked at otolith microchemistry, tagging, and um, genetic information and suggested that the population of southern flounder was an open population down to as far south as Florida. Um, this is a bunch of information on uh, on the the actual background on southern flounder. I don't need to read to you, um, but currently they're managed separately by each state. We wanted to look at, once we got this information that our peer review was not accepted because, again, it's an open population as opposed to a closed population, that's created a real storm in North Carolina. People wanted us to recover the stock, but now that we don't know what the benchmarks are, we don't know whether we're overfished or overfishing, so how do you recover something if you don't even know the most basic tenets of the population? And so we, we started looking, I asked staff to start looking at what was going on in the southern states, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And we were able to see that, you know, we're, we are seeing some declines um, across the board, maybe with the exception of North Carolina recreational going up. I think <clears throat> the reason you're seeing that is because of the incidental take permit for the, for the um, sea turtles. In North Carolina has resulted in significant closures um, that I believe has left more fish in the water that are now available for recreational harvest. So I think there is a, I think there is a reason for that increase in landings um, in in the North Carolina sector. But but for the most part, a lot of the states are holding relatively steady or or declining. And if you look at the commercial fishery, um, which is primarily uh, North Carolina and Florida, there's a pretty pretty noticeable decline. Um, again, the evidence for significant stock mixing is there. Um, we, we continue to tag some of these fish, but uh, very little difference between fish in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And some of the tagging information, um, as you can see, sort of shows that from the circles where the fish were tagged um, and a general southward movement as far as Florida. Um, more tagging information, and this, this report is available for you um, on the internet. Um, but basically we're seeing some long-term declines in North Carolina in our Pamlico Sound Survey. It does appear that there's some declines in the um, Trammel Net Survey in South Carolina, um, and in their electrofishing survey, you can see a pretty significant decline. Um, don't want to speak for South Carolina, but just, just this is the information that we've been able to gather. Um, again, there's the North Carolina survey, the South Carolina, and then the Georgia Trawl Survey, which we received from them is showing a, a decline. I guess that's the Bulldog Survey um, showing a decline in abundance. So um, bottom line, the, this, this fish forms a single population. Um, we're seeing pretty significant fisheries in all the South Atlantic states, too, with significant commercial fisheries, um, evidence for decline and pretty much impossible for us to manage without a, a joint assessment um, working together with, the South, with all the South Atlantic states. 
Um, the beauty of southern flounder is that it is fairly regional. There's not a lot of overlap, and I'm not aware of, there, there may be one or two that have been collected in Virginia, but it's very, very rare um, to see a southern flounder north of North Carolina, really north of Hatteras, and, and they're a different population in the Gulf. We do have some mixing in the nearshore ocean between Gulf flounder and southern flounder, and I think that probably increases as you move south. But I bring this up to the board because I brought up the issue with kingfishes. We talked about doing a kingfish assessment because they are so important to the South Atlantic, and we really didn't have the data to do it, and we've really not done anything. Um, with southern flounder, that is a, you know, at least in North Carolina, it is the number one flounder or the number one targeted species by recreational fishermen um, in our state. And while we'll talk a lot this afternoon about the recreational harvest of summer flounder, um, southern flounder is critically important, I think, to all the South Atlantic states. And so I wanted to provide you with this information. I'm not asking for an ASMFC southern flounder plan. I'm not asking for a technical committee to be developed. I just want to make sure that the southern states have this information, have an opportunity to go back and talk to your technical people. And I think there are several options that we can consider in the future. Um, and first, we need to talk to Bob. But I mean, if there was significant interest, from the South Atlantic Board to develop a Southern Flounder plan, then that would be one option if we have the money and the staff to do so. And after our executive committee meeting today, I don't know that we will. Um, but the other option would be to work, just work together and do like we did in the tr historical Marfin projects where we, you know, Marfin loves to see these interstate cooperations and so there may be an opportunity to generate some bread for the four states to work together to try to construct a, a meaningful um, peer-reviewable stock assessment on southern flounder and then maybe just by by working together with the southern states we could manage this fisher at least have the assessment we need in order to properly make management recommendations so that was the intent and purpose um, behind my my presentation here and really it was for for your information and knowing how important that species is to the South Atlantic board thank you Lewis um, Robert, you have a question? Uh, not a question, just discussion. Okay. Uh, Lewis, thank you for this. And, and you know, it's fitting that we just um, um, reviewed and accepted a, uh, the uh, stock assessment on Black Drum. I believe it was um, you that brought that issue to us. And so I appreciate your foresight um, and certainly appreciate your concerns here. Um, I will tell you, I agree. I think there's some um, some cause for us to, um, to be collectively concerned. Um, we have um, been looking at flounder for a long time in South Carolina. I will say um, from a regulatory management perspective, we don't differentiate among the three species. A flounder is a flounder is a flounder, um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. But uh, certainly we can, uh, with our trammel net data and some other data sets, um, tease that out. And, uh, and we are concerned about um, what we're seeing in terms of trends. Um, you know, we're concerned about a lot of different things. Um, I'm struck by the fact that um, what we see in our blue crab fishery, um, blue crab and flounder seem to share some similar um, recruitment dynamics. Um, and, and we think there are some things that are not necessarily fishery related at this point. Um, but, uh, but in South Carolina, we have a very generous bag limit. Um, uh, but I would also um, be lying if I told you that there was not a lot of political interest in flounder. There is a lot of political interest in flounder. Um, and from a recreational perspective, it's particularly challenging in that um, I think we've been able to convince a lot of our recreational anglers about um, the importance of um, catch and release fishing for species like spotted sea trout and red drum. Um, we've not been as successful uh, in terms of, of cracking that nut with um, recreational um, use of flounder. So um, I'll conclude by saying I know our staff have been in touch with, uh, with your staff, Lewis, about um, sharing some data, um, recognizing that, that this is an open resource and a shared resource, and uh, hoping that by cooperating we can uh, get a better handle on uh, a regional picture. Because uh, I said, I, I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, you know, we're um, have a lot of reasons to believe that, particularly in the northern part of our state, that uh, we're recruiting flounder from North Carolina. So um, I think it's helpful to keep these lines of communication open and appreciate you bringing this to us. Yeah, I'm glad to have been able to do it. 
and and I, and I think what we're seeing in North Carolina is very similar. If y'all recall the Marfin mullet result, and and Florida and North Carolina were particularly happy because South Carolina and Georgia basically provided a sanctuary for the mullet in the winter after they spawned, you know, and then when we really didn't need to worry too much about flounder. I think something what's happening with flounder in the South Atlantic is that a lot of these fish that are coming out of the inlets in North Carolina are heading south and spawning. And I think the fewer of those that come out of North Carolina and head south to spawn, that's what, one of the reasons why I think you're probably having some recruitment issues down there. But at the same time, I think what's spawning off of South Carolina, a lot of it's recruiting into North Carolina and down the road. So I think if we're serious about managing southern flounder, we need to know what the status is. We need to know what the biomass triggers are. Um, and probably need to do something jointly, you know, either again through a gentleman's agreement amongst the four states, which we've done before, or through a commission action. So, thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman, to bring this up. I You're very welcome, uh, Lewis. I just wanted to add one last thing. Um, the Georgia data is from our Georgia DNR trial survey, not not UGA, and also um, we'd be more than willing to share our data. And before we got your call from your staff asking for the information, David Whitaker and his staff in South Carolina asked for it like three months before. So, I mean, we're, we're all kind of on the same page at this time. So, Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. You're very welcome. Okay, our last item on the agenda is um, Kirby's going to tell us about uh, um, Amendment 20B. Um, for the coastal um, pelagic species, uh, has a, the, in the amendment there's some changes to sp uh, Spanish mackerel. He's going to tell us about it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the, I'm going to just give you a brief presentation on the Amendment 20B um, and what it entails. Uh, for today's purposes, this is more for information. Uh, the board does not have to take action, um, but uh, it may be useful for discussion and, and possible action down the road. So just in terms of background, um, in 2011, the omnibus amendment for spot, spotted sea trout and Spanish mackerel went through. Uh, this set up a number of management measures coastwide for Spanish mackerel. Some of the key ones were a 12 inch uh, fork length or 14 inch total length minimum size, uh, chain, seasonal changing uh, of the days and seasonal trip limits, and commercial quota decreases uh, when in a given year the total ACL is exceeded and the stock is overfished. Um, in terms of uh, additional commercial measures, it prohibited per sains uh, and drift gill nets south of Cape Lookout, North Carolina. Um, in terms of the annual commercial quota, it set it at about at approximately 3.13 million pounds annually with an adjusted quota of about 2.88 million pounds. Um, in different scenarios, once approximately 75% of the quota was hit, then the trip limits were reduced by uh, 100 or, or 1,500 uh, pounds. In 2014, Amendment 20A went into effect, uh, which also um, implemented changes to the sale of, of fish caught in tournaments, so bag uh, fish that were counted against recreational bag limits in fish, uh, recreational tournaments were allowed to be sale uh, uh, for commercial use. Um, in 2012, uh, the CDAR 28 uh, Spanish mackerel uh, stock assessment was completed uh, using a statistical age uh, model the, the Beaufort assessment model, and in doing so projected that the 2011 spawning stock biomass was approximately 10.71 million pounds, uh, which was higher than the spawning stock uh, MSY of 7.2 million pounds, and as such, the resource was determined to be not overfished and overfishing, overfishing was not occurring. Uh, the implications of this also were linked to, um, as I mentioned before, the omnibus amendment in that uh, for subsequent years where the 
commercial quota was exceeded as well as the recreational harvest limit were exceeded. Uh, there was no decrease in, this, in the following year's quota or recreational harvest limit. So 20, uh, Amendment 20B was published um, uh, on January 27th and um, became and becomes effective uh, in law on March 1st. And what it does is change the previous Atlantic zone of the uh, Spanish mackerel uh, management unit. So there had been a Gulf zone and an uh, Atlantic zone. And what it does is subdivide the Atlantic zone. Um, the reason for doing so uh, is that the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council had expressed concern that the commercial quota was being filled by fishermen in one state before fish were available to other fishermen in other states. Um, that quota is annually monitored, monitored by um, the Southeast Fishery Science Center. And what the new uh, zones indicate are that uh, the northern zone will extend from approximately the South Carolina, North Carolina border up through uh, approximately uh, Block Island of Rhode Island um, and will have 19.9% uh, of the coastwide uh, commercial quota, which is approximately 662,000 pounds. Uh, for the southern border, or the southern zone, uh, from which will be from North Carolina, the North Carolina, South Carolina border, down through the uh, uh, Monroe, uh, Miami-Dade County um, line, 80% uh, of the coastwide quota will be allotted to that, um, which was approximately 2.67 million pounds. Um, while these quotas will be set to these different zones, uh, quotas can be moved uh, between zones uh, in consultation with the states in each of the zones in, in transferring. Um, in the meantime, NOAA Fisheries will monitor the, the commercial, commercial quotas separately um, in closed federal waters in each zone when respective quotas have been met um, or expected to be met. Um, I have a graph up here to just kind of show a little bit where this these lines will be drawn. Um, so it, it essentially bumps up uh, the Atlantic zone of the uh, Spanish mackerel migratory group to, as I said, that uh, Rhode Island, um, approximately Block Island area out to the EEZ um, and then extends it down. Um, so, uh, if there, are, uh, there's no other elements to this that I was going to present, but if there are any questions, um, please let me know. Thanks. Um, Adam. Thank you very much. Kirby, are you able to comment on if those zones are somehow biology driven based on results of tagging studies or something else that would indicate that they are somewhat separate stocks or is it just purely as a function of management use? My understanding uh, in going through the document at this point is that it's, it's a function of where landings occur. So um, the FMP review for 2013 fishing year has yet to be completed, uh, but in looking historically through landings, um, about 73 percent of the harvest has has been uh, in, in southern states such as Florida. Um, so in 2012, uh, it was approximately 70 percent of the harvest was in Florida, and, and um, 26 percent of the harvest was in North Carolina. Um, so. Uh, in going through and setting those um, zones, um, some of the reasoning behind it was the landings in over the last uh, uh, decade or so, um, and indicating that landings have been dominated by a, a handful of, of states. And so, uh, my read of it is that there's an effort to divide those into different uh, zones. Any other questions or comments? 
Hearing none. Okay, thank you very much, Kirby. Um, that concludes our business, unless if anyone else has anything else. Do I have a motion to adjourn? All right, Joe says I don't have to do that. He tells me that every meeting. Um, we are, thank you for keeping me on track, Joe. I consider us, we are adjourned. Thank you very much in getting us back on schedule.